Hello once again, and today I'd like to start off by thanking those of you who took the time out to watch the Andy Griffith Desilu Locations video. Now, I read most of your comments, and aside from a few that don't like ruining the illusion of the shows, I got the impression that most of you wanted to see more related content. Even though the 40 Acres back lot is gone, the rich history remains on film for all of us. While researching for the last video, I found out some interesting factoids, if you will. So let's take a few minutes and talk about this special place during the television era of 40 Acres. At one point, especially during the Desilu ownership, there were numerous shows that shared the same real estate. So this should be a real fun trip, and hopefully next time you watch one of these shows, you'll be able to pick out some locations and some of the fun moments that we're going to discuss. Just for the purpose of making things just a little bit easier to identify, I'll refer to downtown as Mayberry and Andy's neighborhood, but in fact, they were never really exclusive to the Andy Griffith show. Next door to Andy's house, there was a multi-story structure that was often seen in the background, but it was never really highlighted, for the most part. But it was used in one very funny and popular episode, and I'll show you that in just a minute. That structure or facade was actually Aunt Pity Pat's house from Gone with the Wind. It was hiding in plain sight for years, but it actually snuck into several shows. Here it's looking pretty sharp in an episode of The Untouchables. And now from 1968, let's take a look at Land of the Giants. And oh, by the way, it's been a while, but I can tell you that the series was much more impressive as a youngster, but I had a good time watching it recently. So how funny is this? In season one, episode two, the crew arrived in May, I mean, Midbury. And the first thing they saw, of course, it was Andy's neighborhood. And there's Aunt Pity Pat's house. Actor Kurt Kasner can be seen here actually on the porch of Andy's house, looking in the windows. But before long, they all headed to explore downtown Mayberry. Giants! Uh, 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 giants! But what about the Andy Griffith episode and the Pity Pat House? Well, you really had to have a keen eye to pick it out, but there it is in Season 4, Episode 2, The Haunted House. The house was actually portrayed as being a distance away from Mayberry, but in fact, we all know it was right next door to Andy's. 40 Acres did have railroad tracks running through the property. Probably the most famous belonged to the Atlanta train station set from Gone with the Wind. Much later, another track is seen here in an episode of The Untouchables. It was running into the Western set. And just about in the same area, here's a freeze frame from My Three Sons. They're at the train crossing. Now, while we're discussing My Three Sons, here's Fred Murray riding a bike, and I'm sure you've picked it out. Andy Teller's house is right there in the background. And we'll finish up with the tracks. Two can be seen here in this clip from The Andy Griffith Show. It's where Buddy Epson plays a hobo and befriends Opie. By the way, if that tower looks familiar, it was later used as one of the guard towers at the Hogan's Heroes camp set. Another famous sitcom that began prior to The Andy Griffith Show was The Real McCoys. It ran from 1957 through 1963. So at one point, both shows were operating on the same lot together. In this episode of The Real McCoys, they used the downtown set, or Mayberry. And in the background, you see Andy's house, along with the Pity Pat house. And not to be outdone, the Andy Griffith Show used the barn from The Real McCoys on several occasions. And in this clip from Bonanza, the boys apparently took a ride to Culver City to visit that same barn and, of course, the Baldwin Hills. And there's a great story that connects both The Andy Griffith Show and The Real McCoys, and we'll discuss that in just a moment. So we're now on the southwest portion of the lot, and this is a great aerial picture that shows The Real McCoy set, the Ents Boulevard entrance to the lot, and the bordering neighborhood. Now I know that tower is a bit of a distraction. It belonged to the Continental Oil Company. They drilled on the corner of the back lot, but up through the ground came no bubbling crude. Oil, that is. Black gold, Texas tea. Nothing. <laughs> so it was eventually removed. While we're on this picture, you see a very unique structure. This was the studio's film vault complex. The vaults were built like concrete bunkers. The older film contained silver nitrate, which is very volatile. So the vaults were not only to protect the film, 
but also the surrounding area. Of course, you never let anything go to waste on a back lot. So here are the vaults being dressed up for an episode of Hogan's Heroes. In this clip from The Real McCoys, you see Andy Clyde talking with Walter Brennan. Of course, Andy Clyde went on to appear on The Andy Griffith Show. Now, using our aerial picture, the two would have been standing right where the X is. Behind Andy, you see the tree line that borders the lot to the west and the neighborhood off of Lucerne. The two power poles seen behind Andy are identifiable in the aerial. The first one is here, the second one here. That helps illustrate the angle of the shot. And behind Walter Brennan are the Baldwin Hills. But before we move on, I want to show you a classic shot of Superman. George Reeves standing on top of the Baldwin Hills, looking down on Culver City and 40 Acres. You can clearly see the Terra Mansion set from Gone with the Wind still standing before it was eventually dismantled. Now, that great story that I promised you connecting the real McCoys to the Andy Griffith show involves Richard Crenna. Some might remember him from the Rambo movies, but long before that, he was the co-star of The Real McCoys. And over the run of the series, he began directing as well. When the show ended, it just so happened that the Andy Griffith director, Bob Sweeney, was stepping away to start his own production. Crenna was approached about directing the show and took the job in season three. Now, the real cool part is that both Andy, Ron Howard, and probably most of you consider their favorite episode in the entire series to be Opie the Birdman. Crenna directed that episode. So, in the prior video, we spoke about the Bologna Creek bordering the south side of 40 Acres. Which is true, but at one point, there was a sliver of the back lot across the creek. It was referred to as the Tarzan Jungle. It was a small body of water with a heavy collection of trees and vegetation. Obviously, several Tarzan films were shot here starting in 1943, but not surprisingly, it was repurposed many times. Here it did a great job standing in for the fishing hole on The Andy Griffith Show. This was the episode titled The Jinx. It's the one where Andy's boat sank. Now, Jefferson Boulevard is the street that runs on the opposite side of the Tarzan jungle set. And it also made appearances on several shows over the years. Here's Barney's famous sidecar episode, where he runs a speed trap on Jefferson with the Tarzan trees visible in the background. And probably a few on his motorcycle. <laughs> the property was later turned over to Culver City. In 1963, Jim Neighbors joined the cast of The Andy Griffith Show, which most all of you know spun off into Gomer Pyle, USMC, in 1964. What's your name? Now, the camp set was built in the southwest corner of 40 Acres. It was in the area where the real McCoy's set had been. Now, here's a clip from the show looking west, and you can see the Lucerne Avenue neighborhood. And in this one, looking southeast, you see our old friends, the Baldwin Hills. In this episode, they used the actual backlot guard shack as the camp entrance. They did go on, however, and construct a smaller guard shack and entrance for Camp Henderson. In this aerial shot, you can see just how close Wally's service station was to the Gomer Pyle set. And in this episode of Gomer Pyle, you see them hiding Wally's by placing a truck in front of it. In a later episode of The Andy Griffith Show, you not only get a good look at Wally's service station, but over in the left corner, you see a barracks from Gomer Pyle, and a glimpse of the gate and secondary guard shack that we just spoke about. In 1965, Hogan's Heroes debuted, and the camp set was built in the northwest corner of 40 Acres. Actually, it was over in the area where the Terra Mansion once set. The camp was bordered by Hygura Street on the north and Lucerne Avenue on the west. And the main gate of the camp backed up against a tall earth berm, which shielded the neighborhood off of Hygura. It provided for a nice clean shot, but shooting in other directions was problematic. Now here's a shot of the camp facing southeast. You can clearly see the ever snow-covered Stalak 13 with a nice snow-free Baldwin Hills in the background. Now here's a shot turning west, and you can clearly see the water tower of the Desilu Culver Studio Complex in the distance. Actually, that tower was in the show so many times it got its own billing. But probably even more problematic, you can see the beautiful Southern California palm trees right outside of the camp. By the way, in this picture, you can see several homes bordering the lot on Lucerne Avenue. Unlike 40 Acres, most of them remain there today. And it appears, so do the palm trees. 
Now even the Hogan's Heroes camp set was repurposed several times. Here it is being used in an episode of Mission Impossible. Once again, the studio water tower snuck into the picture. So I think that just about wraps up this video. And no, we didn't get to everything. But in closing, I thought we'd remember Franklin Canyon. Of course, it was used many times, but specifically for the Andy Griffith Open. Now that path and the log that chaired the frame is well known, but it was not always so peaceful. This clip is from a segment of combat. Vic Morrow and co-star Eddie Albert comes across the enemy as they're passing by that same log. And this time it was the bullets that were whistling. So that's a take and it wraps up this video. I hope you had as much fun watching it as I did putting it together. It was a wonderful time in television history. And if you'd like to explore more of the history of 40 Acres, I'd recommend checking out RetroWeb.com, PhantomOfTheBackLots.com, and get yourself a copy of the great book Hollywood's Lost Backlot by Stephen Benchin and Mark Wanamaker. They're all fabulous resources. Thanks again for watching and bye for now. Walking down the avenue where we used to play The house on the corner is still the same today As it was when we were children Innocent as innocent can be Those were the times Those were the ways So take me back So take me back to the good old days Looking back from here I can see that we were blind To the burdens we would shoulder And the struggles we would find But growing made us strong as strong can be Of course you do, Pyle. As far as you're concerned, the whole world's one big mother goose story. Take me back to the good old days. Ain't we lucky to be living in such a friendly town? <laughs> Ha, 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 ha.